Uh, Adrian, as I'm sure Resley's just been explaining, uh, has led quite an extraordinary life. So he has climbed mountains, he has completed marathons and triathlons. Uh, he even ran 30 miles barefoot once just for a bet. Uh, admittedly he said he wouldn't do it again. Um, that's just like me drinking alcohol. Um, I've had some, you know, messy stories. Um, but he represented the Royal Engineers at cycling, shooting, triathlon and uh, formation skydiving. Uh, so after only four years in the sport, he became a national champion and he's gone on to amass uh, over 4,000 jumps and 48 hours in freefall combined. Um, he has coached five world champions and helped hundreds of people to achieve their goal of making a solo skydive. And he ran the uh, Royal Engineers parachute team, um, being selected to take part in the uh, uh, to represent Great Great Britain at the first ever World Air Games uh, in Turkey in 1997. Um, so suffice to say, he's participated in many you know record attempts, helped with the uh, you know in, in and he's helped uh, say numerous people do their solo skydive, even having supported stunt coordination for the James Bond film Tomorrow Never Dies. Um, he saw active service in the Gulf War and then in Bosnia um afterward uh after he trained in bomb disposal uh but since leaving the military due to ill health um he has graduated with a degree uh in uh with honors in psychology uh he's attained his pilot's license as well as becoming a, a fully qualified financial advisor um and uh he's also worked as a barman a dance instructor a lifeguard and uh he's helped start a charity for military veterans so you know absolutely a jack of all trades and master of all of them as well um <laughs> His message today is about not letting fear hold you back. And uh, Adrian believes that we can all live uh, a lead a truly epic life, or as he calls it, the bomb-proof lifestyle. Uh, so without further ado, um, here's Adrian Green. Thanks, Niall. Um, after that introduction, even I'm looking forward to what I'm gonna say. I am so sorry I messed the times up. Um, just got the times wrong, really sorry about that. Um, as I walked towards the bomb, I was thinking, is this going to be the last thing I ever do? Now, that is the way I start one of my keynote talks. And when I say that, I always get the same response from audiences afterwards. They always say, well, you're so brave. And I didn't, I didn't, I always give them the same response. I didn't feel like I was doing anything brave. And what I point out to them is, I knew the bombs were there. So that was that was the biggest thing for me is I knew the bombs were there. I knew how to deal with them. I knew what the render safe procedures were. I knew what I had to do. And what I think is, um, it's funny as we're all walking towards bombs every day in our life. Maybe not literal bombs, but figurative bombs. Uh, things like illness, cancer, um, divorce, separation, redundancy. These bombs are going off all the time and we always expect them to go off in other people's lives and we're always surprised when they go off in ours. And often it's at the most unexpected times that these things occur. So when you think about it, one in three of us is going to get cancer, apparently. Uh, the other thing is apparently one in three of us is Chinese. And that doesn't mean that if you go down the pub with your mate Steve and your mate Wei Lin, that Wei Lin's going to necessarily be the one that gets the chemotherapy. That's, that's not how it works. But my aim today is, is to give you my experiences and hopefully um, what I learned from those experiences will help you deal with, if there are any fuses ticking on any bombs that are about to go off in your life, maybe you'll know the RL, I'll give you the RSP, the render safe procedure, or maybe I can just make you feel a little bit more bomb proof. So before we start, what I wanted to do was just take a quick poll. So what I'd like to do is if you've got a sheet of paper or if you can just make a quick um, tally in your head is to put a tick in, just put a tick on, the, on a piece of paper. If you've experienced any of these, and I'll, I'm gonna read out a list of them. So the first one is, um, if you've ever unexpectedly lost your job through either redundancy or you've been dismissed, maybe you rocked up one day to work and the doors were closed, I don't know, something like that, just put a tick down for that one. Number two, if you've ever witnessed a traumatic event that maybe that you weren't involved in, but you saw something 
I don't know if you saw somebody assaulted or if you were involved in a car accident, something like that. Um, if you witnessed a, a, a traumatic event, then give us a tick. And the next thing, if you've ever had to get divorced or separated, a tick for that one. Number four, if you've ever been involved in an accident, but you were only slightly injured or not injured at all, so maybe a car accident, something like that, but you weren't badly injured. Um, the next one, number five, if you've ever suffered from any kind of um, trauma, something like bullying, like bullying at school, bullying at work, the workplace, um, or some form of abuse, then tick the, give us a tick. And number six, if you've ever experienced the death of an elderly relative, so I don't mean that the death was completely unexpected. If, you know, grandma was 105, she probably wasn't going to make next Christmas. You know, that sort of, that sort of experience. Uh, and number seven, if you've ever been diagnosed with a serious illness, and I'm including mental illness in this, so things like depression, if you've ever had that diagnosis, then give us a tick. And number eight, if you've ever had a loved one, close relative, close friend, son, daughter, spouse, something like that, that's been diagnosed with one of those illnesses, then gives another tick. And number nine, if you have been involved in an accident and you were seriously injured, it did change your life. You, know, you, you might have completely recovered, but you maybe spent a long time in hospital um, or you've, you, you had serious injuries that you had to overcome. Maybe you've still, you know, you're still overcoming those serious injuries. And number 10, the unexpected death of a close friend or relative, um, son, daughter, something like that. So there are 10 things there. And I think I've probably, I've tried to put them in the order that I think is probably the least serious to the most serious, but obviously that's up for discussion. Um, and obviously that list is not exhaustive in any way means whatsoever. It just gives a rough idea. Um, and they're you know, probably the most, the most common ones. So what I'd like to know is, if you have been involved in any of those or how many ticks you've got really, has anybody got over eight ticks? So Wesley's got a seven. Neil's got eight. Yeah, randerson has got seven. Wow, yeah. So it just goes to show, doesn't it? I mean, me personally, the only one I haven't suffered from on there is um, divorce and that's because I haven't managed to get married. Five, Nick's not doing, Nick's doing okay. Yeah, five, that's good. Yeah. So you guys on sevens and eights, wow, you've been, you've been through the mill and I, you know, I feel for you. Just two, Janet, well, just be thankful, Janet, that you've only got two ticks. So the aim of my talk today really is like I said, I just want to help you through, see if I can help you become a, a little bit more uh, bomb-proof. I mean, actually, funnily enough, I had, um, well, it's not funny, but um, one of my close friends uh, died last week, a guy called Angus. He was um, a good friend of mine from the army. He was one of my mentors in bomb disposal, and uh, he helped me through a lot of stuff, more of Angus later. And Angus was one of the youngest soldiers to go to the Falklands War. And after that, he then ended up going into bomb disposal where I met him later on in his career. He was more senior to me. He was in management and um, uh, he was a real a figure that I looked up to. And even after he left the army, I mean, he went to numerous war zones after I was discharged. He then carried on in the army, went to numerous war zones. And even as a civilian, when he left the army, he carried on doing ordnance clearance and helping out in minefield clearances. And he lived in Scotland and it, it, it appears that he, he died falling down the stairs. And I think uh, he'd, see the, he'd see the irony in that. So, um, but as an example of how these things can happen unexpectedly, what I would like to do is um, give you a bit of context of sort of what happened to me. Uh, and the reason, and the way I'd like to do that is by just read you, the first chapter of my book, which will be available online and in all good bookstores when I finish writing it. 
But chapter one is, is called Tough Times, and it sort of explains how my illness arose. So there's only a page and a half. It won't take very long. I daren't move. I knew I couldn't stay like that. A few seconds earlier, I'd just woken up in my single man's bunk in the corporal's mess in Water Beach Barracks in the Cambridgeshire countryside. It was quarter to seven in the morning and time to get up, have a shave, put on my uniform and go to breakfast before starting work at eight o'clock. As I tried to sit up, a jolt of pain flew through my body. It felt like a thousand volts. I couldn't figure out what happened to me. I know I have to get dressed and go to work, but as I try to swing my legs out of bed, another bolt of incredible pain rocks me to the core and I cry out in agony. I try to calm myself down with some self-talk. Okay, Aid, take it easy. Let's just try and figure out what's causing the pain. I move my arms and that seems to go fine. But when I try to move my upper body, that causes the pain again. It seems that even the slightest movement causes an off the scale reaction. And again, I find myself crying out uncontrollably. 20 minutes later, and I've managed to sit on the side of my bed and hook a sock over the toes on my right foot. It's been a level of discomfort I'd never felt before. And I've broken bones from motorbike accidents and cycling accidents, but nothing felt as bad as this. Tears are streaming down my face and I wonder how I'm ever gonna get dressed. Luckily, help is at hand. The next thing I hear is a knock on my door and a Welsh accent. Are you all right, Edie? No, Andy, I need help. My savior is in the shape of my friend Andy, who lives just down the corridor from me. We'd become friends in the last seven months during our spell in the Persian Gulf, taking part in the first Gulf War. Andy's a stocky Welshman, and luckily came to check on me to see if I fancied going to the cookhouse for breakfast. It's, it's not locked, you can come in. I gasped through pained breaths. Andy walks in and instinctively seems to know what he has to do. Without any fuss or warning, he picks me up and proceeds to put me on his shoulder in a fireman's lift, which causes a loud yelp from me. Fortunately, I slept with underpants on, or that could have been even more awkward. As I'm being carried down the stairs to the exit of the mess, other lads have heard my screams of agony and are looking out of their bunk doors. Something is wrong with Edie. I'm taking him to the medical centre. Andy explains to the gawping faces. Outside of the mess block, other soldiers are walking to the cookhouse for breakfast. Well, you can imagine the looks we're getting as Andy walks the 200 metres to the med centre with me on his shoulders and just a pair of underpants and a sock hanging off my right foot. I'm in so much pain, I'm past caring. So that was how it started for me. That was sort of um, seven years of um, illness, uh, seven years of trips to the doctor, seven years of tests, seven years of scans, seven years of painkillers, uh, more scans, more painkillers. But my aches and pains, as I sort of refer to them, the illness seemed to go in, in phases and I could have weeks of remission where I was sort of could live a normal life. Uh, on, on bad days, I was sort of bed bound. And on good days, I tried to make the most of it and do, do what I could. And it was sort of the um, going through those phases that taught me my first lesson. And my first lesson, and if you want to play the game of guess the acronym, the first letter you need is B for belief because I used to go to bed every night. If it was a bad time, I'd believe that tomorrow was gonna to be better. And if it was a good time, I had to believe that tomorrow was gonna to be another good day and that my, my remission was going to keep, um, was gonna last for another day. So the B you need is, is belief. So on the bad days, I used to um, reflect and just think about um, tough times that I'd gone through before. And I just used to think, do you know what? If I'm going through this now, but I've been through tough times before and I can deal with this. And I used to think, well, what have I been through? I've been, as I said, I had motorbike accidents and cycling accidents that I ended up in hospital. I'd had numerous operations on my legs at points where I couldn't, I couldn't walk. I'd been, I'd been bullied at school, nothing, nothing too major. 
I got hung out of a third, fourth, fourth story window, I think it was, by my, my feet at one point. But obviously they didn't drop me. That's good. And I'd been through army basic training. That's pretty tough. And obviously I'd just come back from war. So I figured whatever this disease was that the doctors couldn't seem to figure out, it, it wasn't going to get the better of me. And I knew, I, I, you know, I could I put up with things before and I could put up with this. So to go along with my belief, the next thing that you need to write down is experience. And as you've shown me from the, the ticks that you've already made, you've already got, got quite a lot of experience there. Well, maybe not Janet, but I don't know what those two ticks were for, for Janet. So maybe, you know, they could have been quite serious. But yeah, so just never think from what you've gone through already, um, you've got the experience to know that you're a stronger person. And if you think about muscles, the way that muscles work, I think humans are very similar. We're shaped by our experiences. And, you know, bodybuilders, they do the weights to tear the muscles down and then the muscles build themselves back stronger. And I think that's how humans work. So whatever you've been through, you know, makes you, makes you stronger. So next, the important lesson I learned from the next one is support. So in the army, we were trained to recognize, um, at the time we called it battle fatigue in soldiers. If we'd gone through traumatic events, we had to, in World War I, they called it shell shock. Nowadays, we call it PTSD. And in the army, we were trained to recognize this in soldiers. And the way we were told to treat it was by um, getting the soldiers together in a group of, of like-minded people who'd all been through either the same experience or similar experiences. And, and that really helped. And we know that helps now with PTSD and things. So I think if you can um, find somebody, one of your peers or one of your friends that you can talk to about stuff, then that's, that's one of the best things you can do. Um, sometimes it's, it's not easy to talk to our partners. Um, maybe they don't understand if they don't work at the same place or don't have the same sort of life that we have. And sometimes it's hard to talk to your boss. Um, about these things. So what I was um, asked you to consider is if somebody came up to you and they had this problem, who would you advise them to talk to? And maybe it's you. Maybe you could be the support. Sometimes um, being the support for someone else is the best therapy we can have ourselves. I've noticed that from doing the bombproof lifestyle is um, it's really helped me. I mean, I probably do have PTSD from the experiences that I've gone through, but I've noticed that since I've started helping people and doing, I don't know whether you want to call it life coaching or whatever, but it certainly helped me come to terms with all the things that I've been through. So we've got um, belief, experiences and support. Your mates. I mean, I, I thought my mates would probably not want anything to do with me in the army because, you know, why would they want to be going around with a cripple when they were fit and healthy? But uh, my mates were a, a big support to me um, throughout that time, particularly my skydiving buddies. So for me, one of the things that I found I lost through my um, illness was sport and exercise. Obviously, I wasn't well enough to do sport and exercise all the time, and, and that was a big a big part of me, I'd been um, very active. Um, I was in the army um, triathlon team, the cycling team, the shooting team. I was very fit and active. And all of a sudden to have that taken away, I felt like a big part of me was gone. And I knew I had to get that part back. So I knew I had to pick a sport. And I, I figured that I had to pick a sport where you didn't have to be sort of super fit. So the sport I picked, um, yeah, obviously skydiving. Uh, I saw a, a message on a notice board and it said, if you want to go to Florida and learn to skydive. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm having a, if my illness is in a bit of remission at that point, I can go and learn to skydive. And it's three weeks in Florida. Who's going to say no? So I chose um, skydive. And I think uh, without putting too fine a point on it, skydive had saved my life. Um, and at that point, it gave me a reason to live. So I found that I had to put myself first sometimes and pardon me and exercise a bit of self-care and that self-care was doing something that I really wanted to do and that ended up being skydiving so 
so when you're when you're struggling it's easy to just let things go and, and not look after yourself um you know with your diet and exercise and, and that side of life so if you think about it what i'm trying to do now is is give you habits that you can not just use when times are tough but you need to get yourself into a position where you're better able to cope with things when times are tough so that means putting these habits and things into place now so take care of yourself means you've got to do the diet you've got to look after what you eat what you put inside your body you've got to do that little bit of exercise three or four times a week and, and take care of yourself so that's my my next point is to take take care of yourself i'm rushing i'm wrestling through this i realize i was late starting so i'm I'm trying to sort of catch up a bit of time. I mean, obviously the benefits of exercise, are, you know, we, we all know about um, endorphins. They make you feel good. So if you can, even if you just go out for a walk in the fresh air, the endorphins, the vitamin D is just a, um, a great pick me up. Sometimes fresh air and exercise is all we need. And if you're putting the right stuff into your body at the same time, that's a big help. So what I want to know is um, what hobbies have you got? What do you do when in your downtime? What would you miss if, if you couldn't do it? Make that a priority so that you make sure you do it every day. Make sure you don't miss out on that. Thanks, Randerson. Thanks, yeah. Excellent, excellent advice, advice. And yeah, I think so. It makes, a, it makes a big difference. I know in the Army, um, the Army Physical Training Corps have um, a Latin phrase, and that is mensana incorpore sano. And for those of you who speak Latin about as well as I do, um, that means healthy body, healthy mind. And we know that the two follow each other. So if you can keep yourself healthy, it certainly puts you in a better, better state for coping for when things do get tough. Because, you know, at some point, um, you know, the tough times are going to happen. So the next thing I want to tell you about is the next thing. So... What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is sometimes you've got to go for small wins. If times are tough you, and you just need small wins. So that means just what is the next thing I have to do? So for me, that might mean the next thing is the next sock. I put one sock on, I'm going to put the next sock on. After I put that sock on, I'm maybe going to try and put a pair of trousers on especially if I'm going to try and get to the cookhouse to have something to eat. I mean, at some point, I remember nights for me were the worst because my pain seemed to just uh, magnify. As soon as I sort of sat down and, and stopped being inactive, the pains seemed to just um, become greater in the evening when I was laid in my bed. And I remember at some point the pains were in my, in my rib cage and that even meant that breathing was painful. So I couldn't breathe deeply enough to fall asleep. So I used to just hold my breath just to delay that next breath so that I could just try and get a respite from the pain for a few minutes, well, maybe a minute at a time. So for me, sometimes the next thing was just the next breath. But, you know, I know for you, the next thing might be, you know, is it that next line of code you've got to write? Is it, um, just make a meal plan the next thing for, so make sure you eat healthily for the rest of the week. Whatever that next thing is, just make sure, and enough of those small wins during the day will build up so that at the end of the day, you know, that you've had a pretty good day and you've turned a bad day into a good day. So the next thing I wanted to, um, to share with you is probably the, one of the biggest things that I learned, and it sort of, it, it, it goes along with this, I guess. And um, it sort of helped me out when, when things were really rock bottom. And if I go back to 1994, when I'd just come back from Bosnia, I'd, had, I'd been a, in a period of remission for quite a while, for a few months. So I was sort of doing okay. I was sort of just doing okay on, um, anti-inflammatories and they were sort of getting me through and we then went on exercise to Germany on a bomb disposal exercise and on the way back we were traveling in convoy back to the ferry port in Holland and we stopped at the Dutch-German border 
to have a little bit of a rest and to wait for the Dutch police to escort us to the ferry. And whilst we were there, we were sort of having a, a snooze. We were, we were quite tired. And whilst we were having our snooze, there was a massive accident. A lorry driver had fallen asleep at the wheel and smashed through the checkpoint and the passport checkpoint and wiped out two minibuses full of people. And he, he was in a, a chemical tanker. The chemicals were all over the road. The chemical tanker was exploding. There was fire. It was like something out of a horrific movie scene. But luckily, there were, you know, a dozen soldiers there, each with first aid kits, first aid training, and we ran to help as, as quick as we could. And it was one of the worst accidents, I think, um, in the Dutch, um, his, in the history of the, of the Dutch road sort of roadworks. And I think we had eleven. 11 people injured, six people died by the side of the road. It was, it was horrible. And it was after that, I then ended up, and all this thing was, was just adding up in my brain. I didn't realize what sort of toll it was taking on me, but it was just sort of, it was um, accumulating in my brain. And then after that, I went to Florida on holiday for a skydiving holiday. My girlfriend had decided to come with me. She was also a skydiver. And so just bad luck hit. She had a, a parachute accident and was in a coma for about three months. They didn't think she was going to make it. The doctors thought she, there's no way she's pulling through this. Her injuries were just so severe. And, and if she did su survive, she was definitely going to be paralyzed. Well, as it was, she was. She did survive and she was um, paralyzed. And I then had to go back to work, which is one of the worst things. And I got back and I spoke to Angus, the guy who died last week. And Angus had been with me in Bosnia and we'd gone through a lot of stuff together. And I said, I don't, I don't think I can carry on Angus. I think I've, I'm at my limit now, I've done enough. I can't do any more. And Angus just sat me down and, and said, Aidy, just think of, all the good stuff we did in Bosnia, all the lives we saved, the people that we pulled out of minefields, the booby traps we disarmed. And think of when we went to the, the sites of, of genocide, we, we dealt with the booby traps there that enabled people to gather evidence against these people for war crimes and allowed them to be, um, to be brought to justice. And, it, and that made me realize and thought, you know what, that's, that's right, my life had some meaning, I had to keep going. My job was worthwhile. And I think that goes along with the, with the small wins, you also need some, some big wins. And that big win was, was finding meaning in my life. And as I mentioned before, the Bombproof Lifestyle now does that for me as well, because I feel like it's meaningful to um, giving, you know, giving help to people. It makes it all worthwhile. So I think what, what I'd like you to do now is just think about your job. I mean, I don't know what jobs you do in the mainframe industry, but um, I'm guessing some of it's pretty, pretty important. Um, and if you don't feel that your job is important, then have a think about what would happen if you didn't do your job. What would go wrong? I mean, I just think, you know, credit card fraud, are you involved in that? Are you involved in making sure that people's money stays safe? Are you involved in making sure that people like me get paid? That's a good thing. And um, if you don't think your job is, is at the top of your list, then maybe the top of your list is your family. Maybe you're doing, doing what you're doing because you, you just want to support your, your wife, your children. And that's fine. That's good. That makes it all worthwhile as far as I'm concerned. So just have a think about your job and your life. And try and put some meaning to it. So going back to our acronym, the, o, the, the, the letter that I'm putting down for that is O for objectives. So you have small objectives, just the next thing, and the big objective, the meaning. What's the meaning of all this? So um, my penultimate point is sense of humor. 
And I think that's one of the most important. And certainly a sense of humour got, got us through lots and lots of unpleasant experiences in the army. And often we had quite a, a black sense of humour, quite a dark sense of humour with the things that we'd gone through. So um, and I wanted to give you an example of this just to sort of show you the sort of things that we, we had that kept us going. And again, it goes, it goes back to Bosnia. We were in, a, there was a minefield incident. A couple of foreign soldiers had, had gone into a minefield and unfortunately gone over a mine. The driver had broken legs, I think. And the other guy was probably in some sort of shock and got out of the vehicle and tried to run away. And unfortunately he ran over a mine, uh, ran over a mine with his legs and unfortunately lost a leg. And we had to go in and get these guys out. So we, we got them out, got them evacuated, got them into a helicopter and, and got them safely away to medical attention. And afterwards, we then realized that this guy's boot was still in the minefield and had to be recovered. So at that point, I wasn't really, um, I was only involved in a sort of more managerial role. So I sent a guy called Matt in to recover this guy's boot. And it was about 20 meters in. And Matt's fully togged up. He's got the, the helmet on with the visor. He's got his mine prodder, which is like a basically a knitting needle with a handle on it. And he's, he's prodding in the minefield, just literally clearing his way to get this guy's boot. And you could, the smoke was still coming from this boot. And I was just calling to Matt to say, you know, Matt, how are you doing? Just doing a bit of a check on him. And I said, Matt, how, how's it going? And without batting an eyelid, Matt just turned around to me and went, AD, just a foot to go. <laughs> and that's the sort of humour that we, we had. I mean, we all, we all burst laughing. We, I don't know how long he'd been waiting for me to ask him the question, but that was his response. So <clears throat> for, the, for our acronym, I put down irreverent. Irreverent is just not taking anything seriously. And that's the, one of the best things I think that can get you through tough times is just have a sense of humour. So finally, the last point is, is one that I learned after having an appointment with the doctor. I used to have these appointments every few months and they would go through the same sort of thing. They'd have a review of my painkillers. And I remember on one of these appointments, the doctor said to me, basically, Cool Green, your career is over. You know, you're never going to be fit and healthy again. Just, you know, learn to live with it. I think it frustrated them, the fact that I tried to, to keep everything going. Um, and they just wanted me just to, just to take the painkillers and shut up. And I wasn't prepared to do that. And I came out of that appointment and I just thought, who's that doctor to tell me that my life is over, that my career is over, um, that I'm not going to be fit and normal ever again in my life? He's, he's not in a position to tell me that. He certainly doesn't know who, he doesn't know who A.D. Green is. And... I then put, I decided at that point, I was gonna be committed to get better. And I thought, it's, it's me that decides, it's not him. And that's one of the most important things I think you, you can do in life is you need to take control. And you know, it's, it's up to you, you can decide what happens. I mean, there are some things we can't control and some things you can control. But if you can take control of the things that, that matter, then, you know, you do, you're on the way. So your final, from the final word in our acronym is C for control. So if you've been following, have you worked out what the acronym is so far? Anybody got the full acronym? Well, in summary, let me, let me point it out to you then. Close, yeah, Janet's got it right. Be stoic. So stoic is, is putting up with hardship without complaining. And I think that sort of sums up what resiliency is. So in summary, so you, you be belief. There are better days ahead. You've got to believe that. Things will get better. Sometimes they get worse before they get better, but at some point things are going to get better. E, experience. You've already been through some stuff. So you've got the experience to get through whatever you, you need to get through. Support. That support's there. Remember, you can speak to your friends, speak to comrades. If you need professional help, then it's out there. 
maybe you could be the support yourself. That's the important thing to remember for that one. T, take care of yourself. Remember to put yourself at a priority. When times are bad, sometimes you need to prioritize yourself. Oh, objectives. The next thing and the meaningful thing. And then I, irreverent, just a foot to go. And finally, C, the control. It's up to you to decide what happens, not anybody else. So hopefully, if you've enjoyed my presentation, my name's A.D. Green. If you haven't, then my name's Resley Costabel for the feedback. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, has anybody got any questions or any, anything they'd like to ask me? It doesn't necessarily need to be about resiliency. It can be about, can be about general stuff. Um, the illness was, um, Rusty is asking what the illness was, and it was classified as a form of rheumatism. Um, but then on my, on my medical papers, it, it said something called ankylosing spondylitis, which is definitely not, I have definitely haven't got ankylosing spondylitis. I think they just needed to put down something on the paper so they could get me discharged. Um, I actually believe it was something to do with the chemicals that, that the injections that I was given in the first Gulf War. Um, we were given a, a cocktail of injections, and I think they were they messed up with your nerve endings and things. Uh, uh, and other people have suffered, you know, similar things, and maybe not ended up as, as well off as I have, unfortunately. So I don't know whether we need to share the the feedback screen, Niall. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, I've just put the link for the feedback in the uh, in the chat. Um, okay. So um, if anyone yeah, wants the the link, it's uh, it's there. Uh, it's session six J. Um, I don't know if we need to put the uh, the uh, yeah. There's, I was about to say I don't know if we need to, but there is a um, QR code there uh, for anyone who wants to scan that in on their phone. Um, and um, yeah, we've had uh, Resley says, "How did you stay calm when your parachute didn't open?" I freak out over minor stuff. <laughs> I think it's just by knowing what to do in those situations. You, you know, you're, you're trained, uh, and if something happens, then you just carry on doing the things that you're meant to do, and, and trust that you've been told the right thing to do. One thing I did want to mention actually is um, I know we were talking about the sense of humour thing, and I know Resley mentioned about them. Um, a lot of the guys are keen on Monty Python. I just was struck by the um, resemblance to a guy in a bomb suit and this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought that's, you know, he's the he is resilience personified, that guy, isn't he? Just got a scratch. <laughs> None shall pass. With the, uh, uh, the skydiving, um, I've had people say to me before, you know, when because uh, I was talking about like bucket list things, you know, like I'd love to go skydiving, I'd love to go bungee jumping, and they always say, oh, you know, but what? Wouldn't you be worried? What if it goes wrong? And I said, well, if it goes wrong, I never have to do it again. <laughs> and that's and that's the way I, I I try to use that humor to just sort of think, you know, so it's only a one off. It can only go wrong once. Well, when I was teaching skydiving, I used to say to people, first thing in the morning, the, the thing I would say to them is, you've done the most dangerous thing by driving here. Statistically, you're more likely to have an accident on the way here than you are skydiving. It's pretty safe, to be fair. And tandem skydiving is one of the safest. So don't let that stop you. Exactly. If it's on your bucket list, get it done, honestly. I think everybody should do at least one skydive. So I'd, I'd say it's definitely on my bucket list. I don't know if it's up, for, if it's up there for everyone, but yeah. <laughs> Am I on um, mute? Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Wesley. Yeah, I've got, I, I can't quite see AD because of the session feedback thing, but, but AD, I know that you've, you've told me in the past that on the way, in the plane on the way up to do a skydive, you were famous for falling asleep. Now, <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine being about to jump out of a plane and knowing that and falling asleep. And I'm also thinking like with you walking up to, walking up to bombs and not turning around and running away how how do you how did you keep 
so calm that you could fall asleep or so calm you could keep going towards a bomb? I think we all, we all have our, um, what we call an arousal level where we work at our optimum performance. And my, my arousal level, if you say that five or six is like, is optimum, um, we all have a natural arousal level and my natural arousal level is pretty low. So sometimes, you know, if I was in a, a skydiving competition, it wasn't good for me to fall asleep. You know, it sort of it upset my teammates if I used to fall asleep. So um, I used to sort of try and G myself up a little bit and get myself going a little bit. But I think I'm just naturally a, a, a person that sort of stays, stays pretty calm. And I know now from just from, from the things that I've been through, when other people aren't staying calm, you know, I'm, I can just sort of see a, a clearer way of behaving. And I don't know if that's just because of the things that I've done or if I'm just, you know, naturally born that way. I think I'm naturally a pretty sort of relaxed kind of guy. Um, but otherwise, I think it's just down to training and, and having done a lot of that sort of stuff. You know? Yeah, I, to I told Felix before, before you came into the room that you don't really have a startle reflex. No, not really. No. <laughs> what, what can I mean? What what goes through your mind? What do you focus on? What I'm thinking is, if I'm about to do something scary, I'm sure that what I think about affects me, and I'm wondering what we can take from that. Like, what do you think about when you're walking up to a bomb? Okay, so what I'm thinking about is I'm not thinking about how I feel. I mean, I use you know the the, the start of that keynote where I say. As I walked towards the bomb, I was thinking, is this going to be the last thing I ever do? And it was true on that particular occasion. That was what I was thinking. But all the other times I was walking up to bombs, that was the last thing I was thinking. It was only just because my friend had been killed the day before that I was thinking, is this going to be the last thing I do? Did he realize that that was the last thing he was ever going to do? And what I tried to do, you know, every other time, was think about just what's the next thing I've got to do now and not let my, think about my own feelings. So I think if I thought about my own feelings about what I, what I was doing, I wouldn't be walking up to any bombs. I'd be running the other direction. So I just, I just think the thing to do is just stay focused on what's the next thing you've got to do. I find that really powerful. Hmm. I think it's... Um, you know, that's, that's all you've got to do, really. Just think about the next thing. And luckily, you know, if you've got the, the SOP, the Standard Operating Procedures, then nine times out of ten, the Army's done it a million times. Other people have done it, and they've written the SOP. So all you've got to do is follow what other people have told you to do. You haven't got to make any decisions. That's the hardest thing, is if you've got to figure out stuff. Um, if you can just follow the procedures and, and trust that the procedures work, then you haven't got to think of anything really. You've just got to just do. So what, like, and some, sometimes in our work, we don't have any procedures to follow or we're the ones who are making the procedures or they're kind of vague. Yeah. Then it, that's, that's then when you, you've got to get your prefrontal cortex involved, don't you? And that makes life a whole lot harder. How do I do that? Um, you've just got to figure out what the priorities are. What's the next thing that needs to happen? in order for you to get another step closer to where you've got to get to. Oh. I'm aware Rosie's... I'm hogging all the questions. Other people <laughs> come <laughs> There's no other questions in the chat, uh, Rosalie, so don't worry. Uh, if anyone does have any questions, please do feel free to, to, to contribute. You know, we're more than happy to, to, to uh, engage. Yeah, I'm so sorry I missed the start. I was just thinking I was just going to run off and have something to eat before I started at three o'clock. It's all right for, for me. Food always takes priority. So <laughs> I, 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 I get that. Food and and picking shirts. No, obviously. Yeah. Well, as I say, <laughs> I, dress for the job you want, Adrian. And <laughs> I want it to I be say, Hawaii. What job you want? Yeah, I just want to be in Hawaii. <laughs> so do I. It'd be great today. Um. So yeah, so just a reminder, everyone. Um, I say the feedback form. Uh, the feedback um, form. Please do fill that in. That will be really useful for GSE as an organisation. Uh, it helps us to sort of, um, you know, 
uh, gauge what went well, what what we what we could could uh, change for the future, and and likewise for the speakers, it allows them to gauge um, you know whether areas that they could improve in, uh, and obviously you can submit some constructive criticism there. Um, but um, I'm not seeing any of the questions, so um, I, I just so I want to say I find it really inspiring that that um, that on one hand you've done all this amazing Superman kind of stuff. And yet, on the other hand, you've a number of times over the course of our friendship, you've said stuff like, I'm just a little specky guy. <laughs> and, and, and that also you've that you've gone through having the, the illness that you've been so incredibly unwell, and especially for somebody who's so physical. To go through that, I'm thinking, my gosh, talk about taking a life apart. And the fact that you've just kind of kept going and finding ways forward. I'd hate the word inspiring because it sounds a bit, but I do find you inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. I do think, you know, being a, a little specky twerp is my superpower. <laughs> because I, you know, when I, when I, um, when, when people read that introduction, they're expecting, you know, somebody six foot tall and looking like Christopher Reeve to walk out and and little specky guy walks out who's five foot nine and they're thinking, what? <laughs> and I think that's, you know, that's part of the appeal, I think. It's, you know, you don't have to be like that to do that sort of stuff. Yeah, we all have- A lot, a lot of my friends were six foot six and good looking, but- <laughs> It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be fair. They they need that advantage, Adrian. Otherwise, you exactly. know, the, 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 yeah. Exactly. Anyway, there's nothing wrong with being a swecky guy. I can vouch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> agreed. Um, we're getting close to the end of the session, and I know um, that we'll need to uh, kind of get ready for the the next uh, session, uh, which will be in half an hour's time. And I, I'm just conscious everyone will probably want to get their tea, coffee, um, or food breaks. Um, thank you very much for your time, Adrian. Um, fantastic That's, session. No worries, Niall. I'm so sorry I was late, everybody. I'm I need to apologise. Stop yeah. apologising. <laughs> we've all we've all been there. Um, I've always come back late from work, uh, from lunch. Sorry, take a <laughs> take a siesta. Um, brilliant. Yeah, uh, Janet and and Nick, thank you for the feedback. Excellent session. Uh, fantastic session. Thank you so much, Aid. No worries. Couldn't agree thank more. You, thank you. Yeah, more there. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for the feedback and um, yeah, thank you again, Adrian. And thank you, Resley, for sort of co-chairing. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. pleasure. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. All the best, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye Thank now. you so much. Bye.